Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Good to see everybody today. All of you watching online, welcome. Thank you for being a part of what we uh, have going here with our healing school. We want to begin over here in Proverbs 23. And uh, we're going to continue uh, with what we were teaching on looking at a couple of weeks ago on the seed of the word the seed of the Word of God and uh, how it pertains to our healing, how it pertains to uh, those things that we're believing God for. So let's pray and we'll get started today. Father, we thank you today. Very grateful, Lord, for the opportunity that we have to uh, share these truths from your Word. We just pray in the name of Jesus that they would they would enter into our hearts and into our spirits and make a lasting impact, Lord, because your word declares that it is health to our flesh and medicine to our bones. And Lord, we thank you for that. We ask you in the name of Jesus that you would just quicken these truths to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. So Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7 and it says this, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he, but his heart is not with you. Now, you have to, you can, you, you have to take this scripture out of its setting to apply it to what we're dealing with. But ultimately, what he's saying is that when you sit down with uh, someone... It says, consider diligently what's before you and uh, don't get caught up in everything that's going on here with all of the food that he has on his table and whatnot because ultimately what it's saying is that this guy you're sitting with has an ulterior motive, all right? And, and as he thinks, that's how he is. He can't, he can't change how you are if that's how you think. And uh, the Lord said to me one time years ago, he said, the way you think is the way you will see, and that's how it will be. And that you can't change that. You think it, you see it, that's how it is. And so now to take that out and apply it to what we're saying and what we're dealing with is, is totally applicable because uh, it's still the truth. The way that I think is how it's going to be. And the reason why many people uh, have the problems they have or... Uh, are not overcoming some of the things they could be overcoming is because they aren't controlling their thinking, all right? And I've got to keep my thinking in line with the Word of God because the Word of God, Mark chapter 4, says the Word is the seed, all right? It says the sower sows the Word. The Word is the seed. And we spent time... Uh, a couple weeks ago talking about how that seed will germinate and that seed will grow. So I take the word of God and sow it in my heart and it begins to grow. Now, but having done that, we'll go to Isaiah 26. I've got a responsibility here concerning this where my thinking is concerned and my mind is concerned. And Isaiah 26 and verse 3, it says, You will keep him or her in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. So perfect peace, there is uh, the center column reference in my Bible says peace, peace, all right, or complete peace is what we would, we would say. So you will keep him in complete peace or perfect peace, 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 whose mind, and that word mind there is whose thoughts or imaginations are stayed on you. You will keep him in perfect peace whose thoughts or imagination is stayed on you. So I've got to allow the Word of God, the seed of the Word of God, to form my imagination about a given situation. And the key to, that, to the imagination there is the first part of the Word, the image. It's, it's, it's mentally imaging, all right? 
Now the world and, and a lot of the uh, you know, self-help gurus and whatnot. Now, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, obviously, if the word of God is the basis of that. But the point is, is this, is the way the world calls it mentally imaging. And, and just trying by some kind of osmosis to bring into our lives what we are mentally imaging. Well, there's a certain power to that because, again, the Lord said to me, and we've said, seen it from the Word, the way I think is, is how I'm going to see. One man said it this way. He said, the thing that you meditate on the longest becomes the strongest in your life. And that's the truth. Uh, we'll look at that word meditate in a moment. But... The thoughts or the imagination. So the way that I'm imagining myself, if, if the image that I have of myself is sickly, weak, uh, failing health, old, uh, however weak, then that's how it's going to be. Because I am in charge of how I see myself. And I've said this before. You can be here and facing a physical issue, but you've received healing. And you see yourself well. Well, now that's, I would say, at least, maybe a, uh, uh, this is an uh, understated percentage, but I would say that's at least 50% of the fight is how I see myself. Do I see myself well or do I see myself? Am I imagining myself sick? Because uh, in Mark chapter 5, and you'll know this, this uh, story, the woman with the issue of blood, it said she had spent all that she had and was nothing better but grew worse. So we can see there very, very readily that it would have been very easy for her to have a grow worse mentality. Uh, it's getting worse. It's not getting better. It's getting worse. Well... Uh, I wrote a book a few years ago called First Words Matter, Last Words Stand, and I made a statement in that book, and, and I said this, it's just as easy to say I'm healed and well as it is to say I'm sick and dying. It's just as easy. Uh, the difficulty comes in because of what I'm seeing. I get stuck in what I'm seeing, and, and Isaiah said, the Lord said through Isaiah, if you want to have that perfect peace, then my imagination has to be stayed on him. Or we could say in the New Testament, on the word. It has to be stayed on the word. It has to be stayed on what did he say concerning me. Now, in Psalm 1, this is a very familiar passage of scripture, but it is... The Word of God updates itself for every situation that I may encounter. And uh, we will begin reading uh, verse 1. We'll read through verse 3. He says, Blessed is the man that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. Now I know that in the, in the, the English version of the Bible there's a period there. And I'm not telling you to take the period out. But what I'm saying is notice that the next phrase begins with a conjunction. And. So the two thoughts are being put together. So he's saying his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. And after meditating on the word day and night, he'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in his season. His leaf shall not wither and whatever he does will prosper. Now, this word meditate, and I've talked about this before, but it's the Hebrew word Hagah. And it does mean, and, and I'll, I'll go through this uh, definition, it does mean to talk. It means to mutter to oneself. It means to speak under one's breath or to proclaim. But it also means to imagine. So meditation is not just thinking, it's speaking, but it's not just speaking, it's thinking. It's imagining. There's, there's, a, there's a difference between thinking and imagining. Thinking can be worry. All 
right? Now, imagining can be worry. Because you can imagine the wrong thing. You can imagine yourself dying. You can imagine, you know, I've, I've talked to people before that the enemy, when they were battling a physical sickness that, that could have killed them, the enemy would begin to talk to them, what are your fa- what's your family going to do? What's your spouse going to do? What are your kids going to do? And if a person ever falls over into that trap of, oh my, I could, I could be a widow or, or I could be a widower or, or I could leave my family, well... Now I'm, I'm beginning to get the wrong image. Notice what he says. He says he meditates in the word day and night. So I'm imaging, I'm imagining what does the word say about me. When, when Isaiah says uh, uh, even those that have no strength, he increases their might. And God gives power to the faint. So instead of, it, I, I may be so weak, I can't get out of the bed. But right here, I'm imagining myself strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. See, the essence of faith is that faith sees what God says. Faith sees what God says. And to change what I see, I've, I've got to see what God says. Seeing what God says changes what I see. And so a person, especially a person who's dealing with a, a sickness, even if you're not dealing with a sickness and you're here or watching online to protect your health, unless they do something specifically to keep their mind on the word and on the Lord, it'll eventually go somewhere else. My mind will go somewhere else if I don't intentionally, specifically keep my mind on the word. That's something I have to specifically and intentionally do. Hallelujah. And so when I study and meditate God's word, that begins to change the way I think because I'm seeing something different. All right. And as your thinking changes, my my life changes. As I start thinking of myself well and whole, when I start thinking of myself strong and vibrant and, and full of uh, energy, you know, it's, uh, uh, we've talked a lot about this lately here at the church, but it, it, it bears repeating, you know, it's just something in the world that, that once you reach a certain age, people start talking to you about how now you've got to go downhill. You know, well, you know, you hit this age, the first thing that goes is the legs. You know, you just can't, can't do what you used to do. Well, so what happens then is then that age is what I begin to meditate on. And that age is not any longer just a number of years. It is, it is when I start declining. Okay, whatever age it is. Some people say, I've heard people that were 30 years old talk about how old they were. That doesn't make sense to me, you know. But then there are people that, you know, 50 is not old, 60 is not old, 70 is not old. It's, I, I realize that it's all the way you think about it. And, and I mean, I, I realize that we're all increasing with age, but we're not all getting old. We don't have to get old, all right. We can increase with age and not get old. But it's how do I think about that? If that that 50 represents the decline, then I'll begin to decline. It's just just the way it is. Because it's how I think. As a man thinks, so is he. You can't change that. You, You can't change it. Because how you think is how you'll eventually talk. The way I think is how I talk. That's why Jesus said, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When someone says, uh, I'm old and they're 40 or 50, when someone says, uh, I'm falling apart, they can say and laugh and say, ha, I didn't mean that. They did too because it came out of their mouth. Jesus said, the abundance of the heart and the mouth speaks. And so, if, but if I'm putting the word in my heart, and that's my image, all right? If, if my image of my life is that, Moses walked to his own funeral at 120 years of age 
and his eye was not dim, his, his natural vigor and vitality was not diminished. If that's my image, if the image of my life is to get to a place where I'm satisfied with having lived as long as I want to live, and I just go lay down on my bed or sit in my recliner and check out, then that's how it'll happen. All right? I don't have to allow sickness to take my life or disease to rob me of my life. And, and I realize we've, we've had that situation. Many watching online, some in here, we've had family members that, that lost their life to disease. That doesn't, that doesn't mean they necessarily did something wrong. But what it means is that we understand that that's not the will of God. That's what we understand. And so that's not God's will. So I want to meditate on what His will is. And so that's why you've got to get to where you're dominated by the Word of God, where the Word of God dominates my thinking. And uh, as we're teaching this, I, I know by, by dealing firsthand with people on a regular basis that there are people that are struggling. There are people that, that are, are dealing with issues in their physical bodies, in their health, and they're, they're dealing with these things. And what has to happen is their minds have to be changed about the, the situation and the circumstance. Hallelujah. So, we take God's word and use it ourselves. This is what the word says. This is what it says about me. And this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to be. When you're sowing the seed, the word of God, because we're talking about the, the seed of the word, and waiting for it to increase and grow to the point that it'll bring victory, manifestation of healing, all right? There's a period of time between I believe I receive it and there it is. In, in Mark chapter 11, Jesus teaching on the, the most profound teaching on faith in the entirety of the Bible, Mark chapter 11. He said in verse 22, Jesus answering said unto them, Have faith in God or have the faith of God, the God kind of faith. For truly I say to you that whosoever shall say to this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he'll have whatsoever he says. Then he said, therefore I say unto you, whatso things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. So there's a period of time between I believe, I receive, and the physical manifestation in, in some cases. That doesn't mean the word's not working. It simply means that I am taking what God said. All right, Charles Capp said this one time. He said, you can speak to the mountain and then look at the mountain the next morning, the next week, the next month, and it appears unchanged. He said, but what's happening is the word of God is hollowing it out from the inside. And one day you're going to get up and the mountain's just going to cave in. It's just going to, just going to be done. Well, that is, here Jesus says that the first thing I have to do is believe I have received. That the essence of faith is simply this, is that faith always takes the promises of God at face value. It, it, faith needs no other evidence than what the word says. That's the evidence that faith looks for. And so Jesus said, the first thing is to believe I have received. And then what will follow that? You will have. Now the having follows the believing I have received. I will have it if I have believed I have received it. The having is secondary. It's going to happen. All right, it's, it's, it's like this. When uh, you walk in a, a door, you open a door, the reciprocal is that door is going to close behind you. That's a reciprocal. You came in here today and you sat down in this auditorium. You're going to get back up. If you're going to go home, you're going to get back up. All right? That, that's the reciprocal of it. So the reciprocal, and there's a biblical law of reciprocals, the reciprocal here is believe I have received, you shall have. Not might. Not, it could be, it's the reciprocal of it. It is, it is the, the after action of believing I have received. 
And so when I believe I receive, the next thing to follow is the having. Now in your spirit, in your, your heart, you already have it. You know you have it. But he's talking about the physical manifestation of it. So I already have it. What will begin to happen is your spirit will start painting that picture on the inside of you of a healthy, strong, vibrant person. And, and before you know it, you're not even seeing yourself the way other people are seeing you. And when they say certain things about you, it just doesn't make sense to you because you have so changed the way that you see yourself. Uh, I heard a story one time, and it, it wasn't, well, it was a spiritual story because this man turned his life over to God. To a, uh, a uh, actually went to a, uh, a uh, conference that a man, he's gone to heaven now, a man named Zig Ziglar was putting on, all right? And, and Ziglar was talking about the way you see yourself. And the way you, you, you imagine yourself. And there was a guy there that was in corporate America. And, and he, was, he was over 300 pounds. I mean, he smoked cigarettes. You know, he's so unhealthy. And, uh, and of course, he, Zig Ziglar talked about giving your heart to Christ and, and, and allowing God into your life. Well, he didn't, you know, his own testimony was, you know, I didn't want anything much to do with that God stuff. But, you know, it sounded good what he said about being positive and whatnot. Well, long story short, the guy did end up giving his life to Christ, all right? So praise God. But he started talking about himself different. He started talking about himself being healthy and ta started talking about himself being fit and, and not smoking and not needing to smoke. And he said, uh, he said, I remember two events distinctly. He said, my mind began to change so much through the Word of God and through what I was doing that I begin to see myself fit and healthy and in shape. And he said, I was walking through the grocery store and I was standing there and a little girl uh, looked at her mommy and said, Mommy, look at that fat man. Now, it's a rude kid, number one, okay? But anyway, look at that fat man. And he said, I was looking around for the fat guy. They were talking about me. But he said, I was looking for him. And he said he walked one day, he was, after he had begun this process over a period of months, he was walking down the street and, and he came on one of those, you know, plate glass windows that, that have the, the mirror coating on it. And he said, I looked up and I saw this guy in the mirror and he said, it scared me. I started looking for this big guy. Where's this big guy? And it's me. Well, his mind had so changed about how he was, he didn't even look like himself to him anymore. You know, well, that's what the word does. And so that's why people, people that believe they have received, the, the next step's just having. It's already there. You already see yourself the way God sees you in the word. Because the seed of the word is planted. And if it's not dug up by me, it will just produce indefinitely over and over and over again, it will just keep doing it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And so, what happens is, let's go to Matthew chapter 11. The enemy will try to get us over into this place of doubt. And I know that can sound very simple. But there's no substitute for the word of God going in my heart. Because I've got to take the word firsthand. This is what the word says. And then whatever area that, I, that I'm dealing with, I'll begin to mature in that area. All right? Now, in Matthew 11, verse 2, now when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and he said to him, are you he that should come or do we look for another? Hallelujah. Now at one time, and you know this, but at one time John was absolutely certain that Jesus was the Messiah. I mean, we have at least two uh, uh, indications in the book of John where John himself said, 
That's the Lamb of God. He said it once at the Jordan River to the multitudes that were gathered, and then he said it again to his disciples. And two of them followed Jesus and spent the night in his house. Well, now John is saying, go to him and ask him, are you the one or should we look for another? Hallelujah. So at one time, he was absolutely certain that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, you take that over to what we're teaching on. There are people who at one time knew it was God's will to heal them. They absolutely believed it with all their heart that it is God's will to heal. But what happened is, notice, John wasn't sure after being in prison for however long he had been in there. All right? Believe I receive, I shall have. But there's a period of time. Now, I can shorten it, I believe, from the Word of God. But the point is, there will be a period of time. And what happens during that period of time very often is people begin to wonder and question, is it really God's will to heal me? Is it really the will of God to heal every time? And, and I've dealt with people personally along these lines. Well, I'm just, you know, maybe it's not God's will to heal me. Oh, but, but wait a minute, something's happened here. Somewhere the word of God has ceased to be what my focus is on. I, uh, one time I, I went up to minister to a lady. I had not been pastor here very long. We had not had the church uh, here very long. And there was a man that came to my church. He was a contractor, uh, worked for a contractor, excuse me. He was a carpenter. And he, he asked his, the contractor's wife was in the hospital up over Park Regional. And she had been diagnosed with stage four cancer, liver, uh, kidneys. I mean, it was just basically, basically she was waiting to die. I mean, that's, that's ultimately what it was. And uh, I usually do not go pray for people that, that have not asked me themselves because, you know, a lot of times people want their loved ones touched or their friends touched, and their friends don't really want anything to do with it. They just, you know, they're, they're satisfied to do whatever they're doing. But when he asked me and, and said this man had asked me to come up there and pray, I felt like I should go. So I was, spent the next few days praying about it because I knew I was going to go up there. And the Lord told me, he said, he told me, first of all, he said, you take a certain book that you have in your library and you take it up there and you give it to her. And he said, but when you walk through the door, he's, and this was how specific he was, he said, you shut the door behind you and you look at her and you say, ma'am, I know that you don't know me, but I'm here to tell you, you do not have to die, but you can live. And, I, and, I, and I, I still feel that presence whenever I say that. And I walked into the ICU. She was in the ICU. I walked in the room, and sure enough, there she was laying. I mean, you could barely distinguish her from the sheets. I mean, she was just no color, dying. And I shut the door behind me, and I said, Ma'am, I said, the Lord told me to come and tell you this. You don't know who I am, and I understand that. I said, but I'm telling you, you do not have to die, but you can live. And Honest to God, as I'm standing here before you, her eyes brightened up because at that moment, hope came in in the room. Now, I began to minister to her, and I gave her that book and began to minister the Word of God to her. And uh, uh, I said, you know, this is what I want you to do. And she gave her some scriptures and, and the book to read and the Word of God. And I said, I'll be back in a few days to see you and, and see, see the progress. Well, honestly... I came in, I think it was maybe a week later. I came in a week later, and uh, I mean, she was sitting up in bed. Her color was back. Her hair was combed. She, was, she had her Bible, had that book. You could tell she'd been reading it. And she said, I feel so good. I feel so healthy. I feel so wonderful. And, uh, of course, I left rejoicing. Now, I would love it to tell you that that story ends there. That would be great if I could. But two weeks later, I said, I'll be back. And two weeks later... My father came to visit, and I said, you know, I need to go on a hospital visit. And so he came with me, and uh, uh, he waited in the car. But I went up to her room, and I walked in her room, and she was sitting in her chair. And that ashen color was back, and her mother was behind her brushing her hair. Now, please understand, I have compassion for people. I mean, uh, but it made me mad. It really made me mad because I'd seen the change. And... Uh, uh, I, I began to talk to her, and, 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 and it just came out of my mouth. I said, what happened? I mean, you, were, you know, things were going the right way. 
And I'll never, she never said anything. I'll never forget what her mother said. She looked at me and said, can't you see she's dying? And I looked around the room and I saw over on the nightstand kind of just shoved to the edge of the nightstand was the Bible and the book. And I could tell it hadn't been open. Well, as I walked out of that room, the Lord said to me, because, you know, you feel like a failure. You can feel like a failure because you did what God said. Now, this was early on. I don't feel that way so much anymore. But I walked out of the room and the Lord said to me, he said, she began to believe more what her mother said than what the word said. Now, her mother did not intend to hurt her daughter. She was just trying to be realistic. But what she did was she gave her daughter an image of dying. And sure enough, it was just a few days later she died. Now, the reason for that was she got her focus off of what was bringing life to her. Now, I'm not a medical doctor by any means. But, I mean, I can tell the difference between somebody who looks like they're about to die and somebody who looks healthy. I mean, and, and one week she looks like she's about to die, and the next week she looks very healthy. I mean, color back, sitting up in her bed, saying how much better she feels. Well, what was happening? The Word of God was working. It was working. And now, maybe if we had worked with her a little longer, we could have saw it all work out. But here's the point. John the Baptist forgot because of his circumstance, he stopped meditating on the Word of God. And what can happen is if I'm not careful, if I go into a protracted battle, and there's no guarantee that I won't, there are things that the enemy tries to plague our lives with that it takes a certain amount of time to receive the total physical manifestation of it. But we will, praise God. Because, because the word of God never fails. But the key there is to stay on what the word said about it. Hallelujah. And that's, and that's why a lot of times if you notice what John the Baptist said, he said, are you he that should come or do we look for another? And that's, that's what a lot of people get into, especially where physical healing is concerned. Uh, if, if I could have a tingling in my body or if I could feel something or if I could just see a little change. But here's the problem. After seeing that little change, then my faith would be based on the next change. If I had a tingling in my hands, then my faith would be based on whether that tingling comes every time. If I would just feel better, then my faith would be based on my feeling. And if I didn't feel good, I wouldn't consider myself healed. If I didn't feel the feeling in my hands or feel the burning sensation or whatever it is, then I would not have any faith that anything was occurring. The Word of God, obviously, is the basis for everything we believe. So I, that trumps any feeling. Rather, if I never feel anything, the word says I'm healed. Hallelujah. Now, do you see that? John had every one of those things. John had an audible voice speak to him. Other people heard the voice. John saw the Holy Spirit descend on Jesus and stay there. So John heard the Father say, this is my son. John heard the Father tell him on private occasions the one that you see the Holy Spirit descending on, that's the Lamb of God. So we know at least three different occasions he heard the audible voice of God tell him that was Jesus, that that was the Lamb of God. But yet, when he got into a hard time, he began to question it. Well, what does that tell us? That the outward emotion, the outward feeling is not necessarily faith. God can use it to build my faith but that's not what he wants me to base my faith on. I can't ever base my faith on how I feel or how it looks or what the doctor said. Although I take all of those things into consideration. I mean, faith doesn't deny how I feel. It doesn't deny how it looks. It doesn't deny the doctor's report. It simply reminds me that there's a higher report. I've got, I've got to make a choice. Hallelujah. And so, 
it doesn't matter who we are, how strong in faith we've been. If I start allowing the seed of the word of God to be uh, transplanted in my life, to be pulled out of my heart, I'm capable of doubt. You know, I'm, I'm capable of doubt. Brother Hagin said one time, uh, they, uh, people always used to introduce him as a great man of faith. And he made the statement one time, I heard him say, he said, uh, he said, people say I'm a great man of faith. He said, no, I just have faith in a great God. He said, it's not hard to have great faith when your faith's in God. Now, the reason I'm saying that is if I don't keep the word of God in the forefront of my mind and in the, the first place in my heart, I'm capable of doubting God. All of us are. But when I keep the word of God in the forefront of my mind and in the first place of my heart, it keeps the doubt at bay. The word runs doubt off. Hallelujah. Negative circumstances, we could say sickness, disease, they, they try to just beat the faith out of you and cause doubt to come. You know, I've, I've, I've dealt with people before that were dealing with a long ordeal. And, you know, the thing that I hear so very often is how tired they are. I understand that. I, I understand that. I'm not making light of that. That sickness, that disease can make you tired. But what's it trying to do? It's trying to beat the faith out of them. It's trying to get faith out of them and cause doubt to come. And, and, and that's why if I am tired, if I am weak, if I am in pain, then that can't be the focal point because that will cause doubt to come. Because then the next question will be, if you were healed, why are you still hurting? If you were healed, why don't you look any better? If you were healed, why hasn't this changed? Well, that's the attempt of the enemy to beat faith out of us and get us over here focused on what we can't control. Uh, you know, I can't control necessarily how I feel, but I can control how I respond to how I feel. I don't have to respond to it the same way everyone else does. All right? For instance, very easy example. You'll be at your workplace, and somebody will cough or sneeze or, or whatever, and you'll hear one person, they'll say, oh, I'm getting sick. Well, coughing is not necessarily a sign that you're getting sick. Sneezing is not a sign necessarily that you're getting sick. Are those things accompanied with, do those things accompany people that are sick? Yes, yeah, sometimes. But, you know, sometimes you can stir up some dust and sneeze. You can get an itch in your throat and cough. It doesn't mean I'm sick. But that person, there's always that person on the job every year that will get sick before everybody else. And they're the ones that always talk about it. Oh, I got up this morning, just didn't feel right here. I'm getting sick. Whereas you might get up and not feel right there and say, praise God, I'm the healed of the Lord. I'm a virus-free zone. I'm a flu-free area in the name of Jesus. All right? You're taking your flu shot. You're doing what you need to do. And, but here's the point. You know, far from just, just being positive, you didn't allow that symptom to beat the faith out of you. It, 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 it just didn't happen. In, in Proverbs 13, 12, very simple verse, familiar verse, it says, hope deferred maketh the heart sick. Hallelujah. So when a person is in a situation where they're standing for their healing, sometimes their hope has been deferred. They're not seeing things come to pass as quickly as they want to. Hallelujah. And if that person's not cautious, they can fall into the same trap that John the Baptist fell into. Well, I thought, but now I'm not sure. You know, that's why I always caution people. Am I helping you with this today? That's why I always caution people. You know, there's a place to always examine your heart. You know, do I have unforgiveness? Do I have this? I was talking to a man one time, and he was dealing with a very debilitating disease. And, and I was sitting in the foyer of a church talking to him. And he's a good man, good friend of mine. But uh, he was talking to me because uh, this seemingly came on him just like overnight. I mean, you know, he went from being a very vibrant, strong man to, to really struggling. And uh, so he was talking to me, and he said, you know, I have, I have 
searched my heart. You know, I, there's no unforgiveness in my heart. I've, I've searched. I've done everything. And I just cannot figure out where I left the door open to the enemy. And it came out of my spirit. I want you to understand. You know, there's a place to do that. And I understand that. There's a place to search my heart and see if there's a door open. But this came out of my spirit. I said, brother, the enemy doesn't need a door to try to attack you. That's just what he does. You may have opened a door, but you've asked God to forgive you, you know, but you've searched your heart. You don't see anything. The enemy doesn't need a door to try to attack you. That's what he does. He tries to steal, kill, and destroy. He, he tries to bring things on God's people that God took off of them through the blood of Jesus Christ. So, but my point in saying that is he was so focused on where have I missed it. He was getting off of what the Lord had said. And then the enemy doubles up with the guilt and the condemnation. Uh-huh, see, you must have done something. There's unforgiveness in your heart somewhere. You, you made somebody mad. Something, something is going wrong here. It's not necessarily the case. Can that happen? Yeah. If, if you harbor unforgiveness. You know, there are people who say, well, I've searched my heart. I don't see anything wrong in my life. I believe them. What's the problem? Well, it's like I heard one minister say, there's a devil loose. That's the problem. Uh, he is trying to... St because faith is the substance, the grounds, the conviction, the title deed of what I'm hoping for. So if the enemy can change my picture, my hope, take my hope away, he gets my faith. Because without hope, there's nothing to add faith to. So that's why we all go all the way back to the beginning of the teaching. I've got to keep my mental. This is what I'm hoping for. Hope is a force. It's not hope like religion or like the world. Well, I'm hoping and praying. That's wishing. Our hope is a picture that God has given me of myself healthy. Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible says that when Abraham was beyond hope, all right, it says when he didn't have any hope, any hope, when, 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 when the... There's first word hope means a constant consistent expectation of bad or dread the second word hope means a consistent constant expectation of good so Abraham exchanged the pictures he had the first picture he had you can read that in the book of Genesis before his name was changed to Abraham the first picture he had was uh, uh, too old to have a child dead body can't produce a child Second picture he had, stars of the sky, sands of the seashore as multitude, all right, able to do this. And that picture so energized his body and so, so rolled back the years on his body that not only did he produce Isaac, he produced six more sons after Isaac, all right, after Sarah died. So the point is, that's what the enemy wants to get after is to beat the hope out of you because then he can get to your faith. Well, hope deferred will make the heart sick. But you just keep hanging on to your hope through what? The seed of the word of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So I've got to continue to seek after the word. I've got to be on guard. I've got to be watchful. All right? And, and continue to go after the word. And that's why I always tell people, I consistently, you have to consistently build your faith about your healing. Consistently build your faith about health in your life. Because you can't just afford to go to God just when your back's against the wall. Because I've seen people that tried that and it was too late. 
It was, it was too late. They were too far gone. It's not that God didn't want to heal them, not that the word didn't want to work. They just could not produce faith in that short period of time to get it done. Hallelujah. I want to continually seek God. I've got to be on guard. got to be watchful. I need to recognize something. Here's where a lot of believers, I believe, miss it. That I've got to recognize that unbelief is like gravity. It's always pulling. It's always pulling on me. You know, especially when you're dealing with a situation that may have been going on for a period of time, uh, a period of, of, of months or weeks or years or however long it is. The, the, the propensity there by many people is just to, to, I don't want to use the word give up, but that's, that's the best word I know, is, is just to finally just, well, let's just, let's just go with it. Well, that's unbelief. Unbelief is always pulling like gravity. It's always there. I'm always going to have the opportunity to not believe. You know, when I go to the doctor and I'm believing that I'm going to get this really good report, that he's going to show, tell me how much improvement there is. But I go there and either there's no improvement or not the improvement I think there should be. Well, what is that? Unbelief pulling. Unbelief pulling. I remember when Andrew Womack told the story. They called him one night. Very, well, it would have been very early in the morning, around 3 in the morning, and told him that his son had died. He was dead. I mean, they, he was not just dead on the, host, the emergency room. I'll say this number just so I don't exaggerate. At least three hours he had been dead. Well, I mean, three hours dead? You're dead. <laughs> I mean, but he said what I had to be on guard for was the enemy immediately started on me. There's no use going there. There's no use going up to the hospital. He's been dead for this many number of hours. It's not going to work. Well, he said I had to guard myself from getting sucked over into that unbelief. And he refused to do it. Well, he prayed in the Holy Ghost, quoted the Word of God, but prayed in the Holy Ghost all the way to the hospital. And from where they, they live out in the country in Colorado Springs, it's a, it's a pretty good little drive into the, into the city. But in any event, he got there and they took him to his son. He laid hands on his son. His son came back to life. I mean, is alive and well today. At the men's conference that I was at with Pastor Caldwell here not too long ago, I saw the products that his son produces for his ministry. I mean, he's the, he's the creative mind behind... Uh, marketing Andrew Womack's ministry. And the point is, he could have got sucked over there into that unbelief because he's already dead. Well, they told Jesus the same, same thing. Lord, he stinks by now. But see, Jesus, when Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus and they begin to tell him, if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. All right? Then the people in the crowd. Couldn't this man that had healed others have saved his friend? And Jesus, the Bible says, two things. Twice it says he groaned in his spirit. And, you know, I studied that in depth one time because, I've, you know, I'd always heard it taught that, you know, it was the compassion of Jesus and he was groaning because his friend had died. Well, I began to put the pieces together one day and I studied that that groan means he became exasperated. It literally means Jesus was angry with what they were saying. He wasn't groaning like, oh, he was, you know, why are you doing this? And then the Lord helped me see this. It says Jesus wept. Well, I, it never made sense to me that he was weeping over somebody that he had planned to raise from the dead. Because he said to his disciples, Lazarus sleepeth, we must go and wake him. It's there. Martha and Mary are kind of upset with him, so he's got their unbelief. Then they got, he's got the unbelief of the whole crowd. He's got to keep himself from getting pulled over there in that unbelief. Well, but that was Jesus. Doesn't matter. Jesus could get pulled over into unbelief because he was human. But he, now you understand, he was perfectly human, but he was still human. 
He had to exercise his faith. He's, he's our model. And so remember when he prayed, he said, Lord, I'm not praying for me. I'm praying for those that stand around me. Because I know you've heard me, and I know you always hear me. Roll the stone away. Lazarus, come forth. Here he came. Well, the point is, notice that. He had already decided, I believe I have received. Now it's just the having part of it. But the unbelief was still pulling on him. I know, folks, I know. It would be great to not have any battle with unbelief. Oh, that would be wonderful. It's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Because, because as long as we're in this earth, one day we'll be known as we're known. One, one day our faith will turn to sight. I mean, we'll, we'll see everything we've been believing for. But the point is, right now, no matter what you're dealing with and no matter what you're believing God for in the area of physical healing, I can't afford to get pulled over into unbelief because that's how the enemy will get me. Hallelujah. You can rise above unbelief by applying the power of the word in your life. But you can't just turn off the faith engine and coast. There is no coasting. I, when I was sitting in my living room one day studying for a Sunday morning, uh, this would have been Saturday afternoon, and the Lord gave me the message, uh, uh, every, the statement, every day is a faith day. Every day is a faith day. You get up every day and exercise your faith. You get up every day and apply your faith to something. Because we have to. Because that's, that's the only way that it, that it continues to function. Hallelujah. So we stay focused on the word and resist. We have to actively fight against doubt. Actively fight against it. Because if I don't actively fight against it, the, 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 uh, the hardest thing to do, the hardest thing to overcome many times is just that passivity. Just being passive about things. Well, you know, when the Lord's ready to heal me, he'll heal me. But that's passivity. That's just being passive. And the enemy loves to find passive Christians because they don't offer any resistance. And that's why he's succeeded so much in, in churches and in religion uh, 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 about is it always God's will to heal and maybe God's trying to teach me something through this. If you ever come to the, the point, and I don't believe you will because you go to this church, but the, I know you won't. But the point is, if, you, if a person, and let me use a person, not you. If a person ever comes to the point where they start to question, is God trying to teach me something through this? Then their, their resistance is gone. Because how do we know? I mean, at that point, how do we know? When, when do I learn? When, when, when have I learned enough? At what point of sickness do I have to go to to where I can say, okay, I've learned enough. Is it up to the brink of death? How much pain do I have to suffer before I learn enough? Right? Well, that's why Jesus took our pain. So I don't have to suffer any pain to learn anything. I don't have to suffer any sickness to say, okay, I finally learned enough. Because the Holy Spirit is my teacher. And that's how I learn. And so to develop that resistance and not be swayed by that pull of unbelief, the key is to keep my heart full of the Word. This is what the Word said. It is simple. It is stated so often in churches. But I can't tell you how many times in my, in my Christian walk, not just as a pastor, as a, as a, as a minister, uh, in my Christian walk, that I will go back over to Luke, 14, Luke chapter 4 and just answer the enemy down the same lines that Jesus did. Because when the enemy starts talking, okay, no, 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 devil, the word says this. By his stripes I'm healed. The word says he bore my sicknesses, carried my diseases. The word says Jesus healed them all. The word says he'll bring me health and cure. The word says, and then you keep telling him what the word says. That is the key. Because it shows two things. It shows that I've been meditating on the word. And it shows the enemy has no resistance to the word. None. Because he said in James, resist the devil and he'll flee. 
Well, resistance is that active forward stance. I'm not necessarily fighting the devil. I'm resisting him. How am I resisting him? With the word of God. Because the word of God, Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is, a, is active. All right? It's alive. It's active. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing even between, uh, asunder between the soul and the spirit. So you take the word of God, and the word of God divides between how I feel and what the word says. And it separates the two. And then I'm no longer moved by how I feel. I'm moved by what the Word of God says. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, I want to pray today before we leave. And uh, next week now we'll be laying hands on the sick. Anybody that needs hands laid on them or would like hands laid on them. And receiving communion uh, for uh, the healing in our bodies. Amen. So let's pray today. Father, I thank you today for the Word of God that has gone forth concerning our healing. And I thank you that your word says in Isaiah 55, 11, that it will not return unto us void, but it shall accomplish the thing that you sent it to do. Father, I thank you that you said in the book of Jeremiah that you are watching, actively watching over your word to perform the doing of it. And Lord, your word says in the book of Colossians that all things are upheld by the power of your word. And Lord, or the word of your power. And Father, I thank you that the word of your power is healing our bodies right now. Restoring, making new, making whole, making complete in the name of Jesus. And according to Mark 11, 23 and 24, we take it, we receive it, we have it. It belongs to us in the name of Jesus. And we will stand and receive all that you bought for us at Calvary. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Well, all that are watching online, everyone here, remember next Tuesday we'll be back at 2 p.m. for another great healing school. So until that time, keep the switch of faith turned on. And remember to build your faith and frame your world by the word of God. God bless you.